the broken command in the Garden of Eden yielded a constant curse in the world. The serpent would crawl. Eve would have sorrow and childbearing. And unto Adam, in verse 17 of chapter 3, in Genesis, God said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. The thorn has worked its way into our vernacular the same way that it works its way under our skin. The Apostle Paul and you both know about the proverbial thorn in your flesh. Numbers talks to us about thorns in our side. Joshua spoke to us about thorns in our eyes. Judges speak about thorns that tear your flesh. Proverbs talks to us about thorns that are the way of the froward. Chances are, if you've ever spent any time at all outside, you've encountered thorns. Such was the case with uh, Steve Esty. Is Steve here this morning? He's too shy to put his hand up. I asked Josh if he knew of any place locally where we could get some thorns to fabricate a crown. And it was only a few moments on the phone with his father that they were pretty confident that they could fetch and fabricate a crown of thorns for me. Now, I'm pretty sure that probably Steve Esty is the only person in Fredericton who spent some time who went specifically into the woods to find thorns. Not for berries or not for hardwood, not for maple sap or fish and trout, but for a patch of thorns, hawthorns. Anyone know what a hawthorn is? Anyone not know what a hawthorn is? This is a hawthorn right here, one of many. And uh, it seems to be sharper to me than any needle I've ever tried to sew with. <laughs> that could be... Uh, that could be because we buy them at the dollar store. I don't know. <laughs> Nevertheless, thorns are a part of reality for humanity if you ever spend any time outside at all. They're, they're really not anything you typically would go looking for. They're something you inevitably try to avoid. But the fact of the matter is, is that a thorn is a reminder of sin. It's a reminder of the broken command in the garden that yielded the constant curse in the world. It wouldn't stop, it would continue. It wouldn't uh, arrest, but it would maintain. And, and it's a post-creation creation. Out of everything that you see around you, thorns are something that came about after creation was already completed. You see, it was, an after, it was in the afterthought of God and the failing of humanity in the garden that he decided that thorns also and thistles would come forth. Adam, this is a reminder that's going to continue with you. It's going to catch you by surprise when you're walking through the field and that thorn gashes your leg. And it's then that you're going to remember the place that you were in compared to the place that you are in now. Adam, if you pick a place to sit down when you're working in the field and you feel that pain shoot through, the through your body, that moment you realize you found another patch of thorns, it's going to be a reminder to you of the curse. When you reach down to pick a beautiful flower, husbands, take note, for your wife, and you feel that pain shoot through the hand. It's a reminder of the curse that was left over from the garden. As a matter of fact, you're going to struggle against the thorn to grow anything, anytime, anywhere. It's going to be a continual reminder of what happened in the past. And you're going to have to face it. You're going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to live with it. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 24 verse 30, he said, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over. It wasn't grown over with luscious fruit. And it didn't have rich vegetables that you pull out of the ground. It wasn't pleasure or promise that yielded in that garden. No, it says that it was filled with thorns. You don't have to know anything, and you don't have to do anything to get a field full of thorns. Adam, it's a constant reminder of your wrongdoing. The thorn is a proclamation of your failure. Adam, the thorn, it isn't going to leave you alone. It isn't going to just be something that goes away. It's not going to become extinct. It's part of your reality forever. And it isn't just part of Adam's reality. It's part of our reality as well. 
And then we don't often think about it. We think of the frustration when we, we get stuck with a thorn or we get, we, we get frustrated when we're in the woods and, and all of a sudden we have those things sticking in our legs. We, we don't always at that moment say, well, that, that's a result of my failure. That's a result of humanity's sin. We don't always say that. I mean, we try and deal with it. We get out of there. We, we crawl around or we back up quickly or whatever we do to get out of the patch of thorns that we found ourselves in. But it's not very often that we think of it as a reminder of sin. But it is. It didn't exist before. It wasn't part of God's creation plan. But because of Adam's sin and Eve's sin, it came out of the ground. And he said, Adam, it's going to be a reminder of the curse that I've left you with. His past continually came up before him. It literally grew up around him. The reminder was continual. You're cursed and the ground is cursed. The ground is cursed and you are cursed. You're going to have to live with it, Adam. You're going to have to deal with it. You're never going to have a simple road. It's always going to take work and effort. You're going to till the ground and you're going to turn the soil. You're going to pull rocks and you're going to have to deal with the thorns. You're going to have to plant the seed and wait for the sun to shine and the rain to grow. But you're never going to have to worry much about the thorn patch. I promise. It's just going to come up because it's a method. It's a, it's a reminder of the curse. It's not going to go away. So don't overlook it in Scripture. The thorn holds great significance. The thorn was a symbol of sin. And the thorn was a reminder of the fall. The thorn is significant whenever we see it. So don't, don't miss the moment when it's mentioned. Don't step by it. Because God is trying to show us something wherever and whenever we see the thorn in Scripture. Considering everything that we've just said, now consider this. We know it's a reminder of the wrongdoing. We know it's horrible, and we know that it's a shameful part of our past. But that isn't the where God likes to leave us. Someone say amen. amen. You see, through thorns, God begins to weave a story of great grace and hope. The next time that we see thorns, it isn't in the context of condemnation. Rather... It's in the backside of a desert with a man named Moses. But before God can groom him as a deliverer, he needs to call him out of a place of complacency. And the scripture speaks to us of a burning bush. And we all know that. We've learned that from the time that we were children, from the time that we were young people. But if you'll look into the New Testament, both Jesus in Luke chapter 20 and verse 37, and Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and verse 30, use a special Greek word to describe this bush. They use the Greek word betos, or a briar shrub, a bramble, a bush, or a thorn. And it seems to us that through scripture, if you'll just take a moment and look into it, you'll find that Moses, when God decided to come amongst his people, when he decided to call for a deliverer, when he decided to remind Moses that Israel didn't have to stay in Egypt and she didn't have to remain defeated, she didn't have to stay in bondage, but she could be called out, that when he was looking for a deliverer, he found himself a thorn bush. He found something that was significant of the path. The failure of humanity. And he called to Moses from the midst of the thorn bush. And Moses, the scripture says, turned aside to see the bush that was not consumed. In the midst of that thorn bush, uh, Moses knew that that wood was very, it was, it, it was easy to fuel, easy to make fuel out of. It was easy to light. It was easy to become a flame. It's, that's one of the things that thorns are known for. But here, in the midst of this desert, was this thorn bush that was burning with fire. But it was not consumed and somewhere in the midst of the failure that the thorn represented God stepped out and said Moses I want to call my people out and so I have the ability I have the authority to talk to you from exactly where I'm at I can meet you in the middle of a curse I can meet you in the middle of the worst circumstance I can meet you in the middle of everything that represents a failed past and a hopeless future and I can call a redeemer and a deliverer out of the midst of that hopelessness to turn this whole thing around and in the midst of that situation, God revealed himself to Moses as the deliverer. In the midst of that thorn bush, it, uh, don't miss it, it was significant. There's something about it that God was able to move into the midst of the mess and take up residence and say, I'm in control of this situation. Don't mistake it, Moses. I have the ability to manage Pharaoh. I have the ability to manage Egypt. It's all in my control. I'm over it all because I am the king over the curse. Yes. Oh, Moses said, I've got to step aside to see this. 
He didn't miss the significance. God didn't show up in the most majestic place. He could have, and maybe he should have. He didn't show up in a waterfall oasis in the desert. He went, that would have made a whole lot of sense. He didn't speak to Moses from the most beautiful grove of flowers that was in existence. He, he, he could have. I mean, that would have been perfectly suitable. But God wanted the moment to be of great significance to Moses. So he showed up in the bush that everybody else avoided. He showed up in the circumstance that everybody else was trying to step to the side of and said, Moses, I need you to come a little closer. Come a little closer to this sinful situation. Come a little closer to this bad news scenario because in the midst of bad news, I've got some great news for you. I'm calling a deliverer and I just want to tell CCC today that in the midst of whatever you're walking through, God's got a little bit of good news in the middle of all the bad news because he's able to deliver you and he's able to deliver your situation he's able to reach in turn it around pick you up and put you on a solid rock this morning I'm talking about a deliverer today that calls to us in the midst of our mess God was proving to Moses that he could consume it but rather he decided to control it he could work in the middle of it because he was greater than the curse that the thorn represented is it any wonder that the next place of significance where we see the thorn is God instructing Moses on the construction of the tabernacle? The, mere, the, the material required for use was shittim wood. It's known for its scourging thorns. Do you think it's just a coincidence that God told Moses, I want you to construct the tabernacle out of the wood that comes with thorns? Moses, I need you to get the guys, the gentlemen, the, the men of Israel to get out and to work the field in the midst of all the thorns so they could get the wood that's needed for the construction of the tabernacle. We're going to build it with shittim wood. It's going to take effort. It's going to take time. It's not going to be easy. But it's going to have incredible intention behind it. It isn't just about the frustration of trying to deal with that. It's about the salvation that accompanies this tabernacle that's going to be in the wilderness. You see, this tabernacle is going to be where I reside with my presence. And this tabernacle is going to be where I rest among my people. It's going to be where I give marching orders to Israel, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. I'm going to move and you're going to follow, but I need you to construct that out of wood made from thorns. It's going to take effort. It's going to take time. It's not going to be the easiest. To, Moses, I know it would be great to pick the aromatic cedars of Lebanon. That would be wonderful. But that's not what I'm asking you to use. I, I know that oak would be great and significant of my greatness, but that's not what I'm asking you to use. I'm asking you to take that acacia wood. I'm asking you to take that wood that is accompanied with thorns because it's a symbol. It's a symbol to Israel about what I'm able to do in the midst of sin. It's a symbol, symbol to Israel that regardless of where they are, I'm going to come to where they are. Regardless of the circumstance that they're in, I've come with a message of hope and I've come with a, a message of deliverance. I am going to tabernacle among my people. And so it's significant that God uses that wood for the construction. Isn't that just like God? Yes. Some would say, well, isn't that going to be a a terrible reminder, and God says it's going to be a terrible reminder, but it's got a terrific hope attached to it. It's going to be a terrible reminder of the past, but I'm painting a picture of hope for the future. Don't miss the moment, Israel. Don't miss what I'm trying to say. I know it's out of thorns. It's not going to be easy, but it's very intentional that you need to construct it with this. In Exodus chapter 25, he didn't stop with just the construction of the tabernacle, but he said he wanted the Ark of the Covenant to also be constructed of shittim wood. He said, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. You see, that's where God is going with all this. Because the mess in our life sometimes, God, we look at ourselves and we say, God can't use this. God can't use me. I just represent failure. I represent the past that isn't perfect. I represent humanity at its worst. That's what I represent. But can I tell you that that's the exact thing that God goes searching for. You're the one that God came looking for in this service this morning. That you see yourself as this uh, shameful past person with a past. And, and God sees you as a potential to construct the most valuable thing that he could ever create. 
and a place to tabernacle his presence. You see, we come and all we can see is the wrong and we see the hurt and the shame of the past, but what God sees is the end result of what happens when he gets at work in your life. You see, we see all the, the things that, you know, what's interesting about Thornwood, I wasn't going to include this, and so give me the extra two minutes, but Thornwood, when, when uh, the impurities that, that, that go through the actual plant itself, they get deposited back in the heartwood of the plant. The heartwood of the plant is the place where all of the deposits of, of, of the, whatever is wrong with the wood becomes. And part of the reason that the thornwood is so valuable and it's so useful in construction, it's not easy, but it's useful because the deposits within it are actually an insecticide against anything that would try and destroy it. It becomes, the, the thing in it that is, isn't perfect becomes the thing that causes it to last longer. It's a preservative. And so God said, this is the wood that I want you to use because it's going to contain all, every, everything that's not right. The worst part of the plan is in the wood. And, I, and that is what I'm going to use. Folks, I don't know if you're getting the picture or not yet, but that is exactly what we are. But God says, I can take the worst and take it and turn it into the best. I can take the one that holds all the deposits of the past that are painful and hurtful and shameful. And, and he said, it's that life, it's that person that I'm able to reach in and turn it around. He said, that's the one that I want to use to construct the tabernacle for my glory. And not just the tabernacle for my glory, but use it in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. Because I'm going to dwell with Israel from that very place. So don't overlook the significance of it. And God took that asked them to take that wood, and he asked them to overlay it with pure gold. And so what that high priest would see once a year when he entered into that holiest of holies, what that high priest would see wasn't an indicator of what was underneath. That wood that was so indicative of a shameful past was now covered with pure gold. That wood that was so indicative of a shameful, hopeless situation was now covered with the glory and perfection of God. That God's Shekinah glory dwelt over top of it. I, man, I'm getting a picture of somebody's life this morning that it doesn't matter what sin has done to you. God can turn it around. And you think that what excludes you from the presence of God is actually the thing that causes him to invite you into his presence. That painful past that you think is so shameful, God said, let me turn it around because I need it to declare my glory through. I want to cover it. I want to put my perfection over it. I want to overshadow it. I want the blood of the lamb to be poured onto its life. I'm telling you that somebody in this room this morning, God wants to take an imperfect situation and cover it with his perfection today. And that is the power of the king over the curse. Oh, someone thank God for the power of the blood. When that blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, that place became a place of communion and covering. Sin would separate. But God said, I'm creating a way for humanity to come to me, and I'm creating a way for me to come to humanity. What a picture of a king that's greater than the curse. The final place that I'd like to mention this morning is the field of thorns. It's the last place that Israel encamped before they entered the promised land. It was called Abel Shittim, which means the field of thorns. Numbers 25 references it, verse 1, Joshua 2 and verse 1. It mentions this place that Israel dwelt before they entered into the place of promise. It was a place that God had led them to and allowed them to stay until he was calling them into that promised land that was before them. It was the place of the thorns. It was the field that no doubt was a difficult territory to trudge. It was a difficult place to set the tents up and arrange the tabernacle. It was a, a difficult spot for Israel to kind of segregate and, and, and be prepared for everything that God had called them to do. That place of the thorns. Nobody wants to tent among the thorns. But is it significant that God called them to that place before he called them into the promised land? And only because the promised land is a picture of life after Calvary. 
And God is saying to someone this morning, why would you want to live in the place of the thorns when I can call you into the place of promise? Someone in this room this morning, you're saying, well, my life is such a mess. I, I can relate to the thorn. I can't turn left. I can't turn right. I can't go up and I can't go down. Everything just works against me in my life. Can I tell you that God is saying you don't have to live in that place any longer. I'm calling you into a place of promise. You don't have to live in the curse of the thorn anymore. You can come into the place of the promise. And it was so significant to me. I'd never really thought about it before. You, you read the names and it doesn't always make sense because we don't know Hebrew. Well, we know a little Hebrew now after working with the schooly synagogue and Israel Unger. And you know a little bit about that now. Very little. But you go by the names and it doesn't really make sense. But that Israel was called to camp in the field of thorns. Abel Shittim was where they had to end their journey before they came into the land of the promise. And how significant, because God wants someone to know this morning that you can leave the place of the curse and come into the place of promise this morning. You don't have to stay there. You can come here. It isn't for anyone on the outside. You know that the thorn is the thing that everybody avoids. It's a place that everybody sidesteps. Nobody wants to go back to the briar patch because we don't want to live there. But can I tell you that that's where, that seems like it's where God goes searching for the one who's willing to come into the place of promise. Coming back to the music this morning. What a paradox. A field of thorns or a land of promise. It's what Israel was given for a choice. And no wonder when Joshua led the charge to go in, he had a people that were ready to go with him. Nobody wants to stay in the place, the field of thorns, when they could live in the land of promise. Did you ever wonder why the Roman soldiers took the time to fabricate a crown of thorns. They would have certainly, senselessly, had to search for thorns. They would probably remember where they were, but they had to be intentional about going to find them. They would have taken the time and the pain to shape it and place it upon his head. Matthew 27, verse 29, And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Wow. A crown of thorns. Was it just an opportunistic thought on some soldier's behalf? Was it just another way to produce humiliation and add to the agony of an already horrible crucifixion? Or was it all part? I love the Word of God. Or was it all part of a grander plan on God's behalf to put sin back in its rightful place? Because the soldiers thought that they were adding to the pain of the scourging, but Christ was taking away the sting of sin. When they draped on his shoulders the scarlet robe and when they placed that reed in his right hand, they were mocking. But in the midst of the degradation, was there really a true coronation that was occurring? Because they considered it a curse. Cursed be he that hangs on a tree. The curse of the thorns, everything that it represented. But here in this moment, as they fabricated that crown of thorns and they placed it upon his head, in that moment, they were coronating him as king of the curse. And it seemed like degradation, but really it was a coronation. Because when they did that, what they were really saying was, you are the king of the curse. And can I tell you this morning that if he's king of the curse, then he's king over the curse. He's greater than the curse. He's greater than the impact of the curse. He's greater than the future of the curse. He's greater than whatever the curse has brought into your life. i tell you why. Because in that moment, he became the king over it all. He became the king to command blessing. He became the king to command the curse to be ceased. He, he became the king to command an ushering in of a brand new promise in our lives. I'm glad that I serve the king of the curse this morning. He wasn't just king of it, but he was king over it. You see, the enemy thought 
that he had a perfect plan of death. And, and we're in that season post-Easter, pre-Pentecost. We're in that season when if we were to go back to the time of Christ, the disciples are confused. They're trying to figure out what to do. They're going to go to Jerusalem and tarry and to be endued with the power from on high. They really don't know what's happening. But it was in that season where God was saying there's a transition happening. We're moving from the place of the curse to a place a blessing. We're moving, Israel. You may not realize it, but we're moving. We're moving from the field of thorns into the place of promise. There was a promise coming. Joel talked about it. It was prophesied. It was declared. It was yielded. It said it was going to happen. And you just got to wait. Apostles, you just got to get in that upper room and you got to begin to pray until God moves, until God comes because he doesn't intend for you to live under the power of the curse any longer when you can live under the power of the promise. There's a promise that's yet to be revealed for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. You don't have to live under the curse when you can live under the promise. You don't have to live in the field of thorns when you can move into the place of the Holy Ghost that God wants to bring into your life. You don't have to live there anymore. You can come over into the place of hope that I prepared for you. Would you stand together with me this morning? Jesus warns us in the parable of the sower and the seed. He said that the word isn't always heeded. The reference that he, he turns, or that he refers to is in chapter 8 verse 14 of the book of Luke. He said, and that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and plate riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection he said there's this opposition to what i want to bring you the word is releasing power and the word is releasing authority the word is releasing promise in this room right now but what the enemy wants to do is still let the thorns have their work in our life he wants to he wants it to reach in and crowd out the work of god he wants it to reach in and crowd out the word of god the promises that have been even yielded in this house somebody you got a little glimmer of it by faith a few moments ago you thought maybe maybe my life can get turned around maybe maybe god can fix this maybe god can turn this and, and can i tell you that in that moment you need to reach back and get a hold of what God was doing by faith because right now right about now just you know what time is it 1201 that's the worst time for preachers right there couldn't pick a worse time to look at the look at my watch 1201 he went past noon my my but can I tell you right now right there the enemy's just letting a little thorn creep up in your life and God's saying hang on a minute I got a promise that I want to bring him into and, and he, he's saying be careful because the thorn is going to crowd out the promise if you're not careful but I think I got a room full of people here this morning that you made your mind up I, I think we'll walk into the place of promise there's no sense in living in the field of thorns any longer when God has a promise waiting for me I'm going for it I'm going in you can't hold me back you can't keep me here devil don't try and discourage me don't try and dissuade me my mind's made up I'm going in I'm going for it this morning I'm talking about a promise a promise that God wants to bring the Holy Ghost wants to come in this room I tell you uh, my, my phone's been buzzing on on my uh, on the pulpit here and my watch is buzzing on my wrist because we already had one get the Holy Ghost this morning in Sunday school so I tell you you can say well the promise isn't for here and the promise isn't for now but Rachel Cole just sent me a text message saying that a young person a child was just filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the lower auditorium because regardless of what the what, what the enemy would say there is a king over the curse and God's promise is still yet to be revealed I'm ready for it I want to walk into it come on Joshua lead the way let's go
that's wayward, the one that seems like it's outcast, the one that nobody wants. God's coming for that one this morning. God's looking for someone who's willing to say, I, I gotta abandon it all. I don't have anything in my past that I want to hang on to, Pastor Jack, but I do want to walk into the promise that you got prepared for us. God, open a door this morning. God, make a way this morning. Move whatever needs to be moved. God, prepare whatever needs to be prepared to move the curse out of our life and let a blessing rest. Come on, Moses. God's calling to you. It doesn't matter your past. God's got a purpose for your life. God's got a commission resting on you. If you can hear it, if you won't let the horns crowd out what God wants to do, there's a commission in this room. There's a calling in this room. There's a covering in this room. God wants to take somebody's life that's full of a mess, full of hopelessness, and cover it with his purity and his perfection this morning. Holy Ghost, four words, it's come to me. God said, I'm turning it upside down. I'm turning it over. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that, if everything's upside down in your life right now and it doesn't make sense. God is letting someone know in this room right now that I, he is turning it over. There's a turnover about to occur in your life. There's a turnover, but you've got to be ready to receive it. You've got to be ready to walk into it. That's just a word from God, but would you take a moment and receive it? I don't know who it's for, but someone needs to hear it. I'm turning it over. Come on, everything seems upside right now. God is turning it over. Whatever that thing is you feel like you're living under, God wants you to know that he's over it all and he has the authority to turn it upside down, to right side up. I wonder if every person would just lift your hands, God. We're inviting him to move. If you need the gift of the Holy Ghost, God can fill you with the Holy Ghost right now. If you've never been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, God wants to bring a covering in your life. God wants to cover your life with blood. He wants to bring perfection. He wants to bring his holiness. He wants to bring his anointing. 
I'm inviting you if you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We've got a lot on the plate today, but we got room for that. We've got time for that. We'll shuffle the calendar. We'll move the schedule. We'll adjust the time clock. We'll do whatever we got to do to make sure you're baptized in Jesus' name if you feel like you need to be baptized in Jesus' name this morning. But everybody else, I wonder from the front to the back, God's released promise in this room this morning. And God's turning it around for some folks, but I I, I just like us to pray into that promise for a moment and that we'd be ready to receive whatever God has in store for us in this service. God, your promises are yea and amen. Lord, your word will not return void. That's your promise this morning, God. So we release the authority of your word and we pray in the power of your great name, Jesus. Lord, I'm asking that you would release someone from the stronghold of sin this morning. And God, that you would show them a land of promise, that your call would come to someone who feels like their time is done. Lord, that your call would come to them in the midst, God, of whatever situation seems impossible. You're the God of the impossible this morning. And Lord, I pray that your commission would be in this room. God, the promise would rest on every heart and on every life. God, you came to find the one that everyone else is avoiding. You came to find the one that everyone else has stepped to the side of. You came looking for that one this morning. You're the shepherd that looks for the one lost sheep this morning. God, you're the God that's concerned about the one who doesn't have what everybody else wishes they had. God, I pray this morning that you would meet them right where they are. God, that your promise would rest in their life. That your covering would happen. And God, that your intention from the Old Testament all the way into the new would be revealed in this room this morning. Save to the uttermost. Reach, God, to the uttermost, we ask. In your name, we pray. Would someone just thank God for what he's doing? I need you just to reach out to someone nearby. And would you pray that God's promise would be revealed in their life this morning? I'd love it if if everybody was praying with somebody. Because that's the way that God works. God, God moves from vessel to vessel, from heart to heart, from life to life. I know it's uncomfortable for North American culture for us to be kind of close. But I, I just wish that you would connect for a moment. Come on, there's a promise. There's a promise of a thousand soul revival that we're praying into. There's a promise of lost being found that we're praying about. There's a promise that God's kingdom will come and that his work will be done. There's a promise. Don't stay in a place of thorns when God's called us to a place of promise. Someone pray for your family because God's got promise over your family. Someone pray for a lost loved one because God's got promise over your lost loved ones this morning. Come on, someone pray over your future. The enemy wants to get you mired down in the past, but God you let's just pray into that promise come on Joshua lead the charge come on pastor lead us word of God God let there be a pillar of cloud by day Lord let there be a pillar of fire by night don't let there be any confusion but God I pray that there would be clarity and understanding that there be authority and power that's resting on your people march into your promise God I pray that you would reveal God reveal authority God reveal the devil being defeated and God's kingdom being exalted we pray come on he's king over it he's king over it this morning he's king over it he's king over the curse he's king over every problem he's king over every every challenge He's king over every sickness. He's king over every disease. Come on, rise up, people of God. Rise up, men of God. Rise up, women of God. Yes. 
in the name of Jesus. And we started out this entire service singing about, come let us sing. He's the king over it all. We started out declaring his kingship and we're going to close declaring his kingship this morning. We're going to close declaring that he's king over it all. Would you just turn to your neighbor and say, he's king over it all. He's king over the curse, Ryan. He's king over the sin. God bless you this morning. Actually, just a sec, Cass. Just a sec. Three o'clock. Everyone say three o'clock. Please be back for three o'clock. Take this with you, but then bring this back. We're encouraging you. Part of the whole focus and purpose for today is that we can say never again, but it gives us an opportunity to minister to our community. It's not just about what we receive. It's about what we're able to give. I'll see you at three o'clock. Turn to two neighbors and say, I'll see you here at three. God bless you. You're dismissed.